when the curtain fell for the final time in the Board Gosh Energy Theatre on the 3rd of October 2012, I knew I had experienced something quite extraordinary. I had just sat through five hours of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde in a wonderful performance by the Wide Open Opera Company, and it was difficult to make the transition from the exotic world of Wagner's music to the reality of the Dublin Docklands. Wagner's music has a hypnotic effect. It draws you into its own world. While many people dislike Wagner and his music, Few composers have drawn so much attention to themselves. His music, his life, his sheer presence continue to fascinate and infuriate. I've always found his music compelling, and in recent years I started to wonder how much of an impact he has made on Ireland. I'm Michael Murphy, and over the course of these two programmes, I will explore, in the company of musicologists and musicians, how our relationship with Wagner's music has changed and developed from the 1860s right up to the present time. When was his music first heard in Ireland? How did audiences and critics react? How has he influenced Irish composers and authors? But let's begin with a more general question. Why is the music of Wagner so compelling for so many people? There are a number of qualities of Wagner's music that seem to have pooled audiences in over the years and continue to, to, to fascinate and, and to compel. This is Professor Christopher Morris of NUI Maynooth. One of them, I suppose, is, is this extraordinary combination in, in Wagner's music between what I would call the visceral and the ephemeral. So what I mean by the visceral is a kind of uh, energy and force in Wagner's music, particularly in, 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 in the orchestral writing. Uh, you hear it, for example, when he represents nature. Nature comes across in Wagner as this uh, extraordinary elemental force. Water rushes, thunder rents the air. You can hear the elements, if you like, fire, water, in Wagner's orchestra. And so you hear those, those, those uh, representations of nature a great deal in the ring cycle, for example.
fascinating is that alongside this um, this visceral quality is something that you might think of as an opposite, which is an ability to summon um, something ephemeral, something almost metaphysical and distant. And uh, so often the two will 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 be juxtaposed and they'll alternate so you'll have this this moment of of extraordinary elemental force and then and then suddenly everything goes quiet and we we're we seem to be listening to something in the distance or something transcendental that seems to appear out of, out of nowhere and and here it's less a case of you know a force than of a kind of um uh, ethereal quality and it's the ability to combine those two musics if you like that has always um, been so compelling for me and I think historically uh, has been compelling for so many listeners That was the National Symphony Orchestra of Ireland performing the prelude to Act One of Tristan and Isolde, conducted by Fergus Scheel. And before that we heard Bruno Walter conducting the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra in a performance of the prelude to the Valkyrie. Wagner's name appeared from time to time in the Irish national and regional newspapers as early as the 1850s. Short snippets about the misfortunes of the composer and indeed his niece, the soprano Johanna Wagner, could be found in the pages of the Nina Guardian in 1852 or this article from the Anglo-Celt in 1859. A few days ago, the eminent composer Mr. Wagner was brought before the Tribunal of Augsburg, accused of having insulted the manager of Augsburg Railway Station. The insult consisted in the use of the epithet imbecile. The Tribunal condemned the composer for this word, less harmonious than the music of the future, to pay a fine of 25 florins. More significant, however, was the controversy surrounding the Parisian premier of Tannhäuser. This was a, a legendary um, uh, premier of, of Tannhäuser in 1861 at the Opéra. And uh, the tradition at the Opéra was that you would place the ballet, uh, the obligatory ballet, late in your uh, work and uh, this would allow the members of the uh, jockey club of Paris to um, have dinner and then arrive late to see their favorite members of the uh, corps de ballet. Wagner had the effrontery to place his ballet at the beginning of the first act, too early for the jockey club to arrive and see it. And so they reacted 
with disdain and made their feelings uh, known, uh, whistling, booing, cheering. And apparently, as the run of performances went along, it actually became uh, possible to buy dog whistles outside the opera to take into the performances um, to protest at this effrontery, this refusal to place the ballet in the correct place. Irish newspapers reproduced articles from English and French sources about this debacle. For example, the Irish Times carried a short piece from the Paris correspondent of the Globe newspaper. Of Wagner's Teutonic phantasmagoria called Tannhäuser, forced on the notice of Paris by Berlin pressure, at the expense of £8,000 to the theatre, the less said, the better. This set the tone of other such reports, and it wasn't until the music itself became a regular feature of musical life in Ireland that all things Wagnerian were treated with more gravity. There is little doubt that the strains of Tannhäuser were the first to bring Wagner's name to life for Irish music lovers. At a concert given by the Dublin Philharmonic Society in May 1862, the Austrian pianist Alfred Yell played a piano arrangement of an extract from the Tannhäuser Overture in his encore. It is more than likely that this was Yell's own shortened version and not Liszt's more extensive arrangement, which was itself performed many times in Ireland. That was George Bole with an extract from Liszt's arrangement of the overture to Tannhäuser featuring the famous Pilgrim's March. The Pilgrim's theme was also a popular item with military and marching bands in Ireland. For example, in August 1866 at the Rathdown Horticultural Show, some of the British military bands performed it along with the selection of waltzes, quadrilles, gallops and popular melodies. In the following years, orchestral extracts from Tannhäuser were performed as was the case in 1873 with Edward de Jong's orchestra. We know that the Dublin Musical Society also presented vocal extracts from the opera at its concerts. But of course, what is absent from these various arrangements for piano, wind band, orchestra and choir is the aesthetic experience of the drama itself. Wagner's great idea was to bring together poetry, music, acting and staging so as to maximise the emotional and psychological impact of the drama. Those piecemeal arrangements couldn't be further from that great ideal of the unity of the arts, the Gesamtkunstwerk, as he called it. Let's listen again to the Pilgrim's March from Act 3 of Tannhäuser, but this time in its operatic setting. In this scene, Elizabeth and Wolfram are waiting for Tannhäuser to return from Rome, when suddenly they hear the pilgrims approaching in the distance, and they wonder if Tannhäuser is among them. Elizabeth searches the swelling crowd, but Tannhäuser is not there. Her cry of anguish when the pilgrims pass on is all the more dramatic when heard after the anthem of the pilgrims. And it's only when we experience all this in the theatre that we realise that those violins represent the heavenly host crying for joy at the pilgrims' redemption.
That was Cheryl Studer as Elizabeth and Andrea Schmidt as Wolfram, with the chorus of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden and the Philharmonia Orchestra conducted by Giuseppe Sinopoli. It would be some time to come before Irish audiences could experience for themselves Wagner's unique expressions of pain and pleasure, triumph and tragedy. And it wasn't until the 11th of October, 1875, that one of Wagner's operas, or music dramas, the term he preferred, was first staged in Ireland. The first opera was Lohengrin in 1875, and that was a very star-studded occasion because it was the Royal Italian Opera from Covent Garden, and it was the same production that they had put on in May, but it came to Dublin in October, and Sir Julius Benedict was the conductor, and they had two world-class uh, singers, Emma Albani and Victor Morel. This is Dr. Ita Bosang. As she explains, one of the reviews of the time gives us some insight into how the Dublin audience responded to Lohengrin. It was the reaction that I, I was very taken by because <laughs> I'll have to read a little bit of the, uh, the review. It says, first of all, that it wouldn't be fair to pronounce any dogmatic opinion on Lohengrin after a first hearing, which is very fair. But then it says, nobody can say that Wagner is commonplace and many might say they wish he was. He claims above all to write meaningful music and certainly he expresses terror and pain keenly enough. But for minutes together we have strains not only quite meaningless and noisy, but discordant and offensive and then the worst part comes near the end it says the plain truth is in general terms Wagner did not go well he is too stilted he is too matter of fact he is a musician without song a composer with everything but poetry and finally certainly the rough impression prevalent last night was that if Wagner is the music of the future the future is greatly to be pitied that quotation was from the Freeman's Journal, and the sarcastic reference to the music of the future set a tone that was to dominate its attitude to Wagner for many years to come. The rest of that article gives some very interesting details, not only about the performance, but also about the behaviour of the audience. And we learn, for instance, that the overture was ruined by the continuous late arrival of those who had paid for the dress circle. Shades of the jockey club there. The Irish Times, by contrast, took a less caustic approach towards the music, but the critic did quote one of the denizens of the top gallery, who shouted for all to hear, we don't like Wagner, and we don't want him. It's difficult to understand such a reaction when we hear the moving aria in Fernham Land. Um neu 
Seligkeit der Glaube erteilt durch ihn sich seine Ritterschaft. That was one of the great Wagnerian tenors, Jess Thomas, singing in Fernum Land from Lohengrin with the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. Even though the reception which Lohengrin received at its first Irish performance was less than positive, it was a timely production because in the following year Wagner's Festspielhaus was inaugurated at Bayreuth, an event that was extensively reported on in the Irish papers even before the doors were opened. Here is how a writer in the Nation newspaper announced what would happen. About the end of the present month, an enterprise of a very peculiar and indeed eccentric nature will have come to completion at Bayreuth, a small and out-of-the-way provincial town within the borders of Bavaria. An opera house newly built there will have remained open for 12 nights. Pilgrims from every country in Europe, and even from America, will have sat and listened each for four consecutive evenings to a series of operatic representations. And then, the end for which the house was erected having been attained, its doors will be closed, not improbably forever. The question naturally arises why all this should be so. And the answer is, because Herr Richard de Wagner, whose masterpiece was to be three times brought to a hearing on the occasion, wished to have it so. The anonymous author of that article was right about most things but the doors of Bayreuth are still open. To tell us about this grand plan in more detail, here is Dr. Onya Scheel, lecturer in music at York University. There was a little Rococo theatre in Bayreuth and Wagner had heard it had quite a big stage and he thought maybe this might be suitable. He went to inspect it with his wife Cosima Wagner and realised that it was really too small. It would seat 500 and that wasn't really fit for purpose. He realised quickly enough that he was going to have to build his own theatre and he was very lucky that the town council of Bayreuth got behind him and donated some land on the so-called Green Hill for the theatre. But then, of course, he had to put together enough funding to actually build the theatre. And, you know, it was a giant effort on his part. He created subscription-type certificates, but in the end... What made it really happen was the support of King Ludwig II, who came in behind Wagner and was really his patron and supported him to the hilt, really. And so it was built very gradually and it was finally opened in 1876 with the first complete cycle of the ring. And it was a tremendous occasion. You had uh, visiting royalty from all over Europe and from Brazil even. And I think people realised that this was quite a significant artistic event and that this was going to make history. Wagner's grand plans were not just for a new opera house, but to create a new way of staging opera. What he would have been used to in the theatre was um, very sort of old-fashioned, two-dimensional painted backdrops, maybe undimmed lighting in the auditorium and a very static kind of operatic delivery like stand and deliver type of acting and he came in and he was very very unhappy with opera practice during his own day and he had an ambition to change everything to just shake it all up most of all he wanted to make it a really really serious art form he thought in his own day, it was all about entertainment and he couldn't stand that. You know, he had this um, uh, essay from 1851, a communication to my friends, and he said, I never want to write opera again. He just wanted to do something that was much more serious. What he wanted to do was to make his audiences focus entirely on the artwork. He wanted to create this kind of atmosphere in which everybody's attention was focused solely on what was happening on stage and they were completely invested in it. And what he did there was to create this very, very unusual theatre, very unusual for the time. And he created this wedge-shaped auditorium, uh, no boxes. He didn't want people staring at each other. 
he uh, created this theatre where there were lots and lots of columns and proscenium marches which directed the eye towards the stage. And then, of course, the other really big innovation in Bayreuth was the covered orchestra pit. So the pit was recessed under the stage and it was covered almost entirely with a hood. And this had the effect of, well, it was a very, very singular acoustic effect. It would direct the sound, not directly out into the auditorium, but to the back wall of the stage. And then the sound would hit the back wall and come back out, mixing with the singer's voices. And that would create this kind of immersive sonic environment for the audience. And I remember the first time I was there, it was Tristan and Isolde, and the opening of the prelude just seemed to emerge from nowhere because it was completely dark in the auditorium. And you can't actually really pinpoint where the sound is coming from because of this kind of dispersed sound quality. And it's quite magical. When the first festival at Bayreuth was underway in 1876, Irish music lovers could follow the events in the Daily News, the Freeman's Journal, the Irish Times, the Cork Examiner, and so on. Initially, most of the articles were reproduced from the English and Continental papers, and they usually contained social gossip about Wagner and his entourage. But over time, Irish writers made their thoughts known, especially those who had attended the festival. One such was the Irish composer Charles Villiers Stanford. Professor Jeremy Dibble of Durham University tells us about Stanford's reaction to Wagner. I think it's very interesting uh, when you read Stanford's essay on Bayreuth, which he wrote quite a long, uh, a long time after he'd been to the uh, Feshbiel House in 1876, that he felt that Though there was much to be interested in in Wagner, there was much that was um, slightly abhorrent. The whole tenor of Wagner himself, who turned up with his retinue, um, the whole idea of art, according to Wagner, wasn't particularly appreciated. Stanford remarked on all of Wagner's cronies who were there as well, who lacked criticism, and in Stanford's case... I think most significantly, is that though he loved some of Wagner's music, particularly De Meistersinger and Parsifal, which he, as a conductor himself, gave many performances of in concert, um, he didn't like, for example, the crushing chromaticism of Tristan, and he was deeply critical, I think, of the leitmotivic techniques that Wagner had. He thought they were too plentiful, too dense, too recurrent, and in many ways um, lacked the effect that other composers like Verdi, for example, achieved in their simpler constructions. But it seems that the Bayreuth experience gave Wagnerism in Ireland a strong boost in the arm, and we know from private and public statements that Irish musicians and intellectuals were on the whole deeply impressed by Bayreuth. Robert Prescott-Stewart, who was Professor of Music at Trinity College, Dublin, and later taught at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, wrote privately to his friend O.J. Vignols. Wagner is not so bad as the English press will have him, nor so good as his own pretend to consider him. Prescott Stewart also made his views known in the pages of the Daily Express in three long articles in September 1876. These articles document just about every detail of his visit to Bayreuth, and he addressed his readers at home in Dublin in a very chatty and informal style. I contrived to visit the stage and subterranean orchestra during my morning's ramble about the sacred colosses of the theatre. A door was open, and no one hindering me, I thought your readers might as well have the benefit of my observations. While Prescott Stewart and the other Irish Wagnerians gave their balanced and detailed accounts, it is somewhat disappointing to read the derisory comments that continued to emanate from the Freeman's Journal. This negativity was due to the paper's reliance on its French correspondent for all things Wagnerian. Even if we were on good personal terms with the weird maestro, the very length of his new work would render its representation in Paris impossible. Four nights running? Why, no man knows what a day may bring in France. 
They might begin under the Republic and conclude with a restored empire. But over time, that type of snide commentary faded away. In the decades after the first Bayreuth Festival, Wagner's music featured increasingly in Irish theatres. This was largely thanks to the efforts of the German impresario Karl Rosa, whose famous opera company was responsible for the majority of the productions of Wagner's operas in Ireland from the late 1870s up to the start of the Second World War. The first of Rosa's Wagnerian productions was an English-language version of Der Fliegende Hollander, The Flying Dutchman, in 1877. That was John Tomlinson singing Zenta My Child from an English language version of The Flying Dutchman. One of the first to respond to Rose's production of The Flying Dutchman in Dublin in 1877 was Hercules MacDonald in the Irish Times. As was customary, he gave a summary of the libretto and a dutiful commentary on the performers, but he also made it clear that a knowledge of Wagner's music was essential if music education was to improve in Ireland. There are some who pretend to know all about Wagner and don't. Others who, through want of taste or indolence, have not tried to understand him. At the same time, one may not pretend to very advanced culture or sound musical scholarship and yet be able adequately to appreciate and appropriately value this opera. We do not mean to say that to the general it may not prove caviar, but the ordinary musician will find it worth studying. The Freeman's Journal ran an equally long article and, in its own vernacular way, replaced its customary ambivalence with high praise for the beauty of Wagner's music. The overture is a beautifully conceived composition. Throughout the whole opera there are bits of music of exquisite beauty. Its great characteristic is that none of the parts are subordinate. Things were starting to change. But let's consider here how Wagner's music might have actually appeared on the stage in those days. On your shield again. Well, for a start, you would expect the Wagner operas to have been very heavily cut in the 19th century. So even though Wagner was very precious about his own work, once it was released to other opera houses, there were enormous cuts. So, you know, you, lots of companies would have taken up to an hour off you, typical Wagner opera, and they might well have been performed in different languages. And also, 
you know, at this stage, theatres were still operating with kind of interchangeable scenery. So what was used for one Meyerbeer opera might have been used for a Wagner opera. And, you know, needless to say, that wouldn't necessarily have pleased Wagner, the idea that his opera was really sort of interchangeable in that sense, or at least the scenic aspect of it was interchangeable. But that's how things worked. And really, that's how things continued until quite far into the 20th century, actually, um, that idea of we've got a, a meadow scene here. So we take take out, we brush off the meadow scenery and we've got a church scene here. So what might have been used in Verdi will come in handy for Wagner, that kind of a thing. That all continued until relatively um, late in, in a certain sense, you know, certainly up to the 1920s. The Irish newspapers give us insights from time to time into what went on behind and in front of the scenes. The Freeman's Journal was especially informative on various production issues, such as reducing the length of the opera by about two hours, the need to increase the size of the orchestra, the necessity for more rehearsal time, the preference for English rather than Italian translations, and it didn't spare the conductor who could be heard prompting the chorus during the performance, or the stage manager who wouldn't get off the stage. Ultimately, perhaps, the greatest impact which Wagner had on Ireland at this time was his influence on those public commentators who felt passionately about the progress of musical culture in Ireland. There were repeated calls to improve musical taste and musical education, and inevitably, Wagner's music is cited as a necessity for such progress. In the journal Hibernia in 1882, an anonymous author longed for Carl Rose's return to Ireland with another of Wagner's music dramas. The performance of which would do much to compensate for the comparative dearth of artistic musical instruction in our city and the utter absence of progress in our musical ideas and knowledge. The author was not alone in these sentiments and some seven years later, George Bernard Shaw remarked, Ireland has not reached the Wagnerian stage yet. I have been there and I know. But efforts continued to bring Wagner into mainstream musical education and in 1888, Prescott Stewart introduced Wagner onto the syllabus of the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Perhaps the most significant event towards the end of the century occurred in 1893 when Tannhäuser was first produced in Ireland some 30 years after its Parisian debut and again it was given by the Carl Rosa Company. This was a highly significant production because if anything indicates that Wagner had become normalised in Ireland, it is the response of the Freeman's Journal to that particular production. Three long articles were published in August and September of 1893, which devoted much attention to the work. Gone is the negative griping at the difficulty of Wagner's music, and instead we have an informed and sustained discussion on opera in general and on Wagner in particular. Most remarkable of all was the author's lament that it had taken Ireland so long to catch up with the rest of Europe. How extraordinary it seems now that all through the days of Grisi and Mario and La Blache and Cruvelli and Viardo Garcia and Titiens and all the other great vocal stars who've appeared here in succession during that long interval, the opera of the great German should never have found its way hither. Of course we know better than that now. As the demand for Wagner's music increased, his reach extended beyond the opera houses and into the concert halls. Perhaps the most influential figure in this regard was the Italian composer, pianist and teacher Michele Esposito, Jeremy Dibble again. When Esposito turned up in Dublin in 1882, he'd already spent four years in Paris, and there he developed quite an appetite for Wagner, in many ways very much against the current taste of the uh, Société Nationale de Musique, with people like uh, Sasson, who were less keen, so Esposito was going against the grain somewhat, I think, there. Uh, when he came to Dublin initially, his attentions were mainly to sort of piano teaching and chamber music, but Later on, when he founded the Dublin Orchestral Society, this semi-professional organisation which gave a whole series of uh, orchestral concerts uh, between around about 1898 and the First World War, Esposito 
very quickly latched onto the idea of giving Wagnerites. So this became quite a norm, you know, extracts from the ring, Liebes told of Tristan and Isolde, the Vorspiel, the Vorspiel of, of die Meistersinger, and so on. That was the National Youth Orchestra of Ireland's 1999 performance of the Overture to Die Meistersinger, conducted by Alexander Anisimov. While Esposito single-handedly did what he could to satisfy Irish audiences' appetite for Wagner in his concerts, one wealthy businessman took a more radical approach and turned his own home, Woodbrook, into a venue for Wagnerian concerts. Ita Bosang again. There were six concerts from the 11th to the 16th of August, uh, 1913, and Stanley Cochran, who was a wonderful music patron, sportsman, and he was also mineral water manufacturer, Cantrell and Cochran, CNC, I think it's still, is still there. So he built a special woodbook sports hall which turned into an opera house or a concert hall and he invited the London Symphony Orchestra conducted by Hamilton Harty to give a series of concerts and there was a lot of Wagner in fact there was one complete Wagner concert for the third concert there was a grand Wagnerian program consisting of excerpts from Meister Singers Tan Heuser Tristan, Lohengrin, The Ring, and finishing with The Ride of the Valkyries. And the prelude to Act 3, Lohengrin, had to be cut out due to the late arrival of a large section of the audience due to no fault of their own. Well, actually, that was because the trains let them down. Stanley Cochran was very generous and he arranged a special matinee for people who had been disappointed for the third concert. So they repeated the Grand Wagnerian program at a matinee on the last day of their engagement in Woodbrook. One of the pieces which audiences would have heard was the prelude to Act Three of Lohengrin, performed here by the National Youth Orchestra of Ireland.
While Wagner's star was in the ascendant in Irish culture, so too was the Gaelic Revival. One of the most prominent figures in the Revival and an ardent Wagnerian was Annie Patterson, composer, organist, critic with the Weekly Irish Times and lecturer in music at University College Cork. Inspired by the success of Wagner's Festspielhaus in fostering German art, in 1900, Patterson asked the question, why not a British Bayreuth in Dublin? The venue would be the Theatre Royal. However, this plan obviously came to naught. Some nine years later, she came up with a different plan, as Dr Axel Klein explains. One of her really grandest ideas that I've ever uh, come across uh, was this plan to turn the Hill of Tara into an Irish Bayreuth, which is a scheme which she, which she published in an issue of the Journal of the Ivernian Society in 1908. It's a long, uh, quite interesting article uh, with illustrations where the, the Hill of Tara is to be seen and the kind of buildings that she uh, proposed. She actually went as far as uh, devising this kind of architectural scheme of what types of buildings should should be should be built on the hill of Tara, and the main building, of course, was to be uh, what she called a hall of song, and that should resemble more or less the Festspielhaus in Bayreuth. But uh, she actually thought of a musical event taking up to two weeks in in a year, which should gather the whole musical community of Ireland in celebrating uh, Irish musical culture and particularly opera. Patterson's plans went far beyond just a hall of song and an annual event. Dr. Jennifer O'Connor Madsen explains. As well as the Centre for Music and a possible concert hall, she saw it as being a place where there could be offices for other artistic organisations such as members of the Gaelic League or the Oireachtas. She also felt that there was the possibility that eventually there could be a publishing house there so that the likes of Irish composers wouldn't have to struggle with convincing London publishers to produce their works. They would be able to have them published here at home. And as well as that, she had great ideas for a centre for art as well, where there could be works of art displayed and Irish musicians and Irish artists and Irish writers could all be brought together. The root causes of this failed plan were the indifference of her peers and the impossibility of finding the requisite sums of money. Her initial kind of evaluation of the project is that it would cost at least a hundred thousand pounds, and this is in 1908, to develop the infrastructure around the Hill of Tara as well as building the actual structure that would hold this Centre for the Arts. And then she also suggests that on top of that, ideally you would be looking for 50,000 more in order to provide grants and funding to get the project on its feet in the first few years. And then she had this idea, well, didn't Wagner have this idea of asking a wealthy patron and in the form of uh, the, the Bavarian king? And she quite easily assumed that once that project would be publicized, then some American or Irish millionaire would come up and finance uh, the rebuilding of the Hill of Tara. Even though that castle in the sky evaporated, it is clear that Wagnerism had taken a firm hold in Ireland before the end of the 19th century and it found expression in all sorts of places. T.F. Woodlock published a piece entitled A Pilgrimage to the Shrine of Wagner in the Irish Monthly in 1881. While his article gives many interesting and sometimes humorous nuggets of information about his visit to Bayreuth, it is essentially about his experience of Parsifal, and his concluding words on Wagner's final masterpiece speak for Wagnerians the world over. It is true. I have said little or nothing of the music, for what can I say? It has astounded me. It has entranced me. Yet I cannot tell how or why it has done this. There are passages of the highest beauty. There are moments when the music is so expressive that one ceases to be conscious that it is music. But it is hopeless for me to attempt to give an idea, even the faintest, of the musical wonders of Parsifal. It is beyond the expressive power of words.